from Chicago Public Radio, this is Odyssey. I'm Gretchen Helfrich. Imagine this scenario. You're at the office and your boss tells you that you have to work late to finish a project because she has changed the deadline at the last minute. This isn't fair and it happens all the time and it makes you angry. Your heart starts to beat a little faster and the heat rises in your cheeks. Most of us might look at this scenario and recognize that something similar has happened to us. Maybe not at work, but we've all felt strong emotions. There are some people who would look at this scenario and ask a question. Which part of it is the emotion? Is it the judgment that the boss is being unfair? Is it the pounding heart? Is it the recognition that your heart is pounding? Specifying what an emotion is, is an old project going back at least to Aristotle. And at the heart of it, so to speak, is the question of how much thinking or cognition, or what we might even call reason, is a component of emotion. Why does this matter? Well, today on Odyssey, we are going to revisit the question of what an emotion is and ask why getting a handle on the definition might matter Joining us for the conversation are two philosophers. We are joined from Durham, North Carolina by Jesse Prince, and from Santa Cruz, California, we're joined by Jerome New. Jerry New, let me ask you to start. Um, this is an old question, and the debate has looked a, a lot the same for a long time. Can you tell me about how the emotion debate has been organized? Well, I think f from my point of view, the two traditions of argument about the nature of emotion are best epitomized by the philosophers David Hume and Spinoza. For Hume, an, em an emotion is basically an affect, an impression or a sensation with an idea incidentally attached. So when you're angry, your stomach turns, the adrenaline flows, uh, and that's your anger. You happen to think of your boss in your example, and therefore you're angry at your boss. For Spinoza, it's roughly the reverse. An emotion is basically essentially an idea or a thought or a belief with the affect incidentally attached. So when you're angry, the essential thing is that someone has done you harm or your boss has treated you unfairly. And it doesn't much matter whether the stomach is turning or the adrenaline is flowing. After all, that could happen as a result of what you ate for lunch. It's only anger in connection with the appropriate causal beliefs. Now this divide between two different approaches to the emotions goes back, as you mentioned in your introduction, at least to Aristotle, who pointed out that if you ask a scientist what anger is, he'll tell you it's the boiling of the blood or whatever the physiology of the time thought. If you ask, said Aristotle, the dialectician, he'll tell you it's the desire for revenge for a slight. The two traditions, I believe, are actually exemplified in each of our own experiences. That is, sometimes when a friend tells us he is angry, we urge him to lie down and rest in the hope that with time, the feeling, like a headache, will pass. Sometimes, however, we ask why our friend is angry in the hope that understanding his reasons and discussing them will help. That if, for example, he discovers that his beliefs are ill-founded, his feeling will change. All right, so broadly speaking, two camps in this long-standing debate. Let's, um, let's hear why people put themselves in one camp or another. Jesse Prince, let me ask you to start. You are more in the Humean or affect camp. Why take that position? From your point of view, what is an emotion? Well, the view that I adopt is really innovated by William James. Uh, Hume is certainly a uh, inspirer behind this tradition, but according to James, the key is the bodily response, or more exactly, our perception thereof. So common sense would say that if you see a snake or some other emotionally charged object, you have an emotion, and that emotion results in a bodily reaction. Maybe it's a, a racing heart, perspiration, tightening of the muscles. For James, that natural order is exactly wrong. It's exactly reversed. In fact, what happens is the perception of the snake leads to a bodily change directly with no intervening judgment, no intervening cognition. It's the perception of the bodily change that is the emotion. An emotion is nothing more than experiencing our body go into a state of perturbation as a result of encountering or experiencing an object that's salient or significant to us. 
Okay, so let me ask you to, to clarify. Is the emotion the bodily change or the apprehension of the bodily change? It would be the apprehension. Okay, but it's not the apprehension of the situation. That's right. The apprehension of the situation is a cause of the emotion. It's what causes the emotion to occur. The apprehension can include a judgment. You might actually cogitate and reflect on your danger. But it's equally common for an emotion to occur without any judgment whatsoever. The mere perception of a snake, the mere perception of a bug crawling across your kitchen unexpectedly at night can put us into the bodily state that we experience as an emotion. Training your emotions, learning to be a healthy emotional responder is training yourself to have these automatic bodily responses without the intervening state of judgment. So you see a bear and you run and you're afraid not because you saw the bear but because you see that you're running. Well you have the fear because you saw the bear but the fear itself is your perception of the running. That's right. We, we don't cry because we're sad we're sad because we cry. We're not afraid because we run. The fear is the perception of the running. Jerry New, um, from your point of view, you're more in the Spinoza camp. Um, what is? What would you say an emotion is? Well, one of the problems with the Jamesian approach, the notion that um, we're sad because we cry, is the simple fact that we sometimes are sad and don't cry at all. It, at a deeper level, the problem has to do uh, with mistaking the issue as one of causal order. It's not a question of which comes first, the bodily response or the thought. There's a range of issues that have to be understood in order to interpret what your particular emotional state is. And the Spinoza's claim is not that the thought comes first, but that the thought plays the essential role in determining what your particular state of mind is. So, for example, emotions, unlike sensations, have objects. You're angry at someone in particular. And the bodily state does not give the object. You need the thought to get that. Secondly, if you only had the bodily states, you couldn't draw the distinctions that we in fact do draw between our very, very diverse emotional states. So for example, the difference between regret and remorse is not that one involves an ache in the lower uh, part of the stomach and remorse involves an ache in the upper part. It has to do with the beliefs. Regret involves the thought that something is wrong or a mistake, whereas remorse adds an additional thought namely that you're somehow responsible for things being wrong or a mistake. And finally, though there are many other points to be made, it's not clear that the Jamesian model where you see the bear and then you run and then realize that you're afraid will work for long-term emotions where you're angry at your boss, boss for 20 years. Uh, why won't it? Because your body won't be in the same state for those 20 years? Right. Uh, your, your body, you're not physically upset when you love someone for 20 years or are angry at them for 20 years. Your body may be quiescent most of that time. Mm -hmm. And nonetheless, it might be a true description of your state of mind to say that you've loved that person deeply for 20 years. Jesse Prince, presumably you've thought about these objections. Um, why in, in the face of them, they seem quite powerful. Why do you want to maintain the affect position or the, the body okay. first position? Well, there was a fair amount of uh, content in there. Let me see if I can uh, recall. Uh, one issue is whether you can be sad without uh, crying, whether you can be sad without bodily response. Uh, I think that's pretty much an empirical question. We need to look at people when they're sad and see what's going on in their bodies. Clearly, crying isn't necessary for sadness, but nobody would claim that it is. According to James, there's a whole suite of bodily changes that can take place when we're sad, and you need to be in some subset of that collection of possible changes. Crying is one of them, uh, but, but there are many others. Now, if we're to ask, just as a conceptual question, whether one could be sad without any bodily upset at all, I, I think the conceptual issue favors the Jamesian. Because if we were to find somebody who claimed to be sad but wasn't even disposed to have any bodily disruption, was in a perfectly placid, calm, physiological state and remained that way, we would question whether they really knew what sadness was, whether they were really uh, telling the truth, or whether they were lying. That's the same for long-term emotions. If somebody says that they're in love or that they're angry or that they um, have rage towards their mother and never show that sign of rage when, um, when asked or probed, through bodily response, we would question their sincerity. It seems that most of our mental terms have both dispositional and occurrent uses, which is to say any mental term can refer to a current state of the organism or to a state that they're simply disposed to have. If we say that Jerry thinks that snow is white, we don't mean that he's actually having that thought at this moment in time. We mean he's disposed to have that thought. If we say that Jerry is sickened by current politics, then we don't think that he's actually sick at the moment. We just think that on reflection, he might feel a set 
a, a state of physical upset. Likewise with the emotions, we can use them to refer to mere dispositions to have these bodily states or to the actual bodily states. The key point is that if you're not going to enter into a bodily state at some point in reflecting on the issue at hand, then you don't qualify as having an emotion. Um, let me jump in here for a moment. Um, there's a lot sure. on the table. I do want to remind folks that they're listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. Our question today is, what is an emotion? This is a long-standing question. There have been two camps, basically one that puts mental activity at the forefront, one that puts physiological response. We're hearing some of the arguments for each position. Um, I have a question about uh, what Jesse Prince said about empirical answers. Um, Jerry New, let me put it to you. Why is, I mean, I mean, couldn't this question be answered by empirical research? Well, empirical research requires a theory to tell you what you're looking for. And let me focus on the particular point that Jesse just made, namely that if you have an emotion without, or a putative emotion without any physiological upset, uh, doesn't it really amount to a bare thought? And I want to concede something to that claim. That is, emotion does have to be more than bare thought. You might think that your boss, to use your original example, was unfair to you without being upset, without being angry. But I don't think that physiological upset is the only way to draw the line between emotion and non-emotion, even though it is the typical line. In addition to physiological upset, your thoughts may be accompanied by dispositions to behavior. So there are what David Hume recognized as calm passions. Say, uh, I'm afraid that George Bush may be elected president again. My stomach's not churning, the adrenaline's not flowing, yet it's a correct description of my emotional state of mind. And that it's a real state of mind would be evidenced by dispositions to behavior like getting out the vote. Well, well, so well, well wait, did, 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 yeah. you just sort of made a jump here, but I mean, not there's lots of jumps being made. <laughs> to say that it's yeah. a correct description of your state of mind, aren't you presuming that you've already uh, defined something here? Why is it a correct description of your state of mind? Because I think that emotions in our own um, vocabularies are in fact conglomerates, complex states involving physiological upsets, ideas, dispositions to behavior, and other sensations, other things uh, going on that we organize and then say now we're in the state of mind of jealousy. They're not as though they, we have these marbles of feeling that we're born with that have labels on them. Societies, and this will connect with various cross-cultural issues, divide up our, our, our life experience in a variety of ways and we pick out certain ones as salient emotions. All right, so we've got to take a break, but I want to ask you, Jerry New, bottom line, well, not bottom line, but so you're saying that there can be authentic emotions, true, genuine, correctly described emotions that do not involve a physiological response. Right, or not, at least not violent. Uh, there may be some neurophysiology going on, but there needn't be a visceral response of the th thought of the sort that William James thought was essential. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to ask uh, some complicating questions of our initial question, what is an emotion, and dig a little deeper into what is hanging in the balance here. What difference does it make whether one takes the affect position, the Humean position or the Spinoza position, whether one says an emotion is a mental object or a physical object. We'll dig in a little more after a break. I'm Gretchen Helfrich and you're listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. I'm Gretchen Helfrich. On the program today, we are talking about the emotions, asking what emotions are, and hearing different arguments about the appropriate quantity of mental and physiological activity that goes into defining an emotion. Our guests today are Jesse Prince, who is a philosopher. He's joining us from Durham, North Carolina. He is the author of a forthcoming book on emotional perception. He's a philosopher at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And we are also joined by Jerome New, who is a philosopher at the University of California at Santa Cruz and the author of A Tear is an Intellectual Thing, The Meanings of Emotion. I want to talk a little more about the, the, the or put this whole conversation in uh, the context of this long history of having this argument. Um, Jesse Prince, 
Oh, let me ask you this. If, as, as both of you have said, this argument goes back to Aristotle, what's new here? In other words, what do we have new to bring to bear on the question of what an emotion is? Oh, uh, I'm glad you asked, because I think when James proposed that emotions are nothing but perceptions of the body, he was going on introspective evidence. That is, he thought that if you imagine to yourself an emotion, an intense emotion, and systematically subtracted in your mind all of the bodily symptoms, the racing heart, the perspiration, the tightened muscles, you would find that you had no emotion left at the end of that mental subtraction. But that exercise of introspection didn't convince everyone. What we have now is a whole retinue of evidence coming from psychology and neuroscience that points to a Jamesian picture. So for example, we now know that the areas that are active in the brain in every single neuroimaging study that's been done of people in emotional states are areas that have been independently associated with the perception of bodily response. We know that people with mental disorders that prevent them per from perceiving their bodily states, including something called pure autonomic failure, which prevents people from feeling changes in their autonomic nervous system, those people report a, a diminishing or a lessening of their emotional experience. We know that there are people uh, who experience emotions as a result of induction through very primitive brain pathways that don't involve the neocortex, don't involve the most sophisticated part of the brain where cognition seems to be taking place. We know from uh, evidence on rat models, on, on non-human animals, that there's a pathway that goes from the most primitive subcortical components of the visual system, the thalamus, into a structure called the amygdala, which is a control center for bodily response. In, in human beings, the same architecture exists, and an emotion can be triggered by simply seeing something before you have had any time to think about it. The bodily change that takes place is experienced as an emotion, reported as an emotion, and can be experienced as such before any reflection takes place. We also know from psychology that the mere change in facial expression, the mere change in facial musculature brought on by, by changing uh, our face, can cause an experience of an emotional response. In studies, subjects have been given manipulations that cause them to change the shape of their face by, say, pronouncing vowels, not knowing that they're, they're changing their face in ways that are consistent with an emotion. And then they're asked to make various judgments, evaluative judgments. It turns out that people who have been, say, making E sounds, which cause their face to form an inadvertent smile, make more positive judgments than people who have been forced to, say, make a U sound, which forces them into a facial configuration that's more consistent with disgust or other unpleasant emotions. Is that true people for German people, too? They, well, they, they, that study was actually done in Germany. Uh, we don't and, have an U uh, sound. It might just make us frustrated. <laughs> Yeah, it'd be hard to do this here. Uh, but, but on American subjects, people have done tasks where they've had to put a pen in their mouth and either hold it with their lips or with their teeth and then use that pen to fill out a questionnaire. Well, when they hold it with their teeth, they make a smile. With their lips, they make a frown. And their responses suggest that the smile makes them happy, the frown makes them sad. Jerry knew. Um He's got neural imaging studies. Come on, you got to just pack it in, don't you? <laughs> Not quite. Uh, I think it's certainly true that there have been great advances in physiology and especially neurophysiology, so we're not stuck with Aristotle's boiling of the blood to account for the physiological element in the emotions, which I, and as far as I know, no one else wants to deny. Nonetheless, um, despite those advances, and more specific ones, like Paul Ekman has done these studies of, about the face and claims that there are these six basic universal emotional expressions, and corresponding to that, affect programs, neurophysiological programs uh, that embody these universal emotions. All of those are advances, but despite that, you don't get the full picture unless you add an understanding of the conceptual structure through which we look at the world. Because affect programs like Ekman make happiness, disgust, surprise basic emotions, but jealousy, love, aren't emotions, or at least aren't basic emotions, because there's not a fixed universal neurological mechanism uh, connected with them. It seems to me any theory of emotions which excludes jealousy and love as emotions, because we don't have the corresponding neurophysiology, seems to me to be missing something. If you ask me about what the modern advances have been, other than filling in the details about physiology and neurophysiology, I would look instead, say, to Freud, who's helped us understand unconscious emotions. 
psychoanalyst. All of us, independent of psychoanalysis, recognize that we may be the last person to realize we're jealous. To go back to a point I made earlier, we recognize that we're jealous, or others do before we do, through our behavior. We're following the beloved around, opening the mail, and so on. And even though we may not feel anything and so deny that we feel jealous, nonetheless, we are jealous. We can recognize it through our observable behavior. Freud goes a step further and adds the, the point that there are unconscious thoughts which also may account for behavior through emotions that we're not aware of at all. Jesse Prince, I want to ask you something. Uh, my understanding is that there's some cross-cultural evidence which suggests, co contrary to the, the six basic emotions evidence, there's other evidence that suggests that there's actually a, a good deal of variety in emotional um, experiences across cultures um, in a way that suggests that societies produce emotions or at least produce uh, that, that, that you train people to have certain kinds of emotions and, and, and experience things a certain way um, and I'm wondering what that evidence or what the suggestion of, of a sort of socially based or socially constructed picture of the emotions does for your affect uh, approach. I think that challenge was a very serious one for the traditional Jamesian theory. And here's a place where I depart with, with James and actually make a concession to something that Jerry said at the beginning of the hour. So Jerry pointed out that the Jamesian has a difficulty explaining distinctions between emotions. There simply aren't enough physiological patterns to go around. We have many more emotions than we have bodily states. Of course, there's an infinite variety of bodily states, but there seem to be only a small number of fixed states that come up again and again in emotional studies but there are more emotions than that. How do we get this variety, and how in particular do we get the kind of variety that you see when you break the cultural boundary? My suspicion is that emotions have to be identified not merely by patterns of bodily response, but by the eliciting conditions, the external factors that lead those bodily responses to occur. That is to say that these bodily responses have a function. They have a function of alerting us to various things that are going on in the world. That doesn't mean we have to have a thought when we have an emotion. It just means that the emotion is registering something about our relationship to the environment. In different cultures, different aspects of the environment may be more salient. Different kinds of emotional responses will occur because cultures will train people to have bodily response to a different range of eliciting conditions. The range of emotions that we have is potentially unlimited because the very small set of bodily responses that we tend to fall into can be recalibrated or retuned to different eliciting conditions. So where does that make you come down on this question of the, the six basic emotions? In other words, the, the idea that emotions are some sort of part of our natural hardwiring. I'm of the view that there are basic emotions in the following sense. We do have a default tendency to have certain bodily responses in response to certain eliciting conditions. We'll get a sense of arousal if somebody pulls a chair from under us. We may get a sense of startle if we hear a loud sudden, sudden noise. But I don't think that those responses correspond to the emotions that we have words for. Once you get a cognitively sophisticated creature, a human being with mature intellectual capacity, what happens is those very primitive bodily responses get retuned. Even our words like anger and fear, some of the seemingly more basic emotions, or sadness for that matter, or joy, have been tinged or affected or colored by a cultural setting. The things that we're afraid of now extend beyond pulling a chair from under us, or hearing a loud sudden noise. As soon as that happens, fear takes on a culturally specific meaning. It well, names a family of emotions that vary from culture to culture. Okay, but it sounds like what you're saying is that there's a whole lot of cognition that goes into setting up a person's emotional system, even though the actual experience of an emotion on a given occasion doesn't necessarily have to involve cognition or reason. Uh, that, that's right. So culture may do this largely through cognition. It can do it through various kinds of conditioning processes as well. But condition, c conditioning is, is a limited resource for learning. Thinking, reflecting may help set up emotional responses. The ultimate goal, though, is to have these emotions occur without that intervening middleman, that delaying step of judgment. Jesse Prince is a philosopher at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. He's joining us today from Durham, North Carolina. He is the author of a forthcoming book on emotional perception. We are talking today about the emotions and the relationship between reason or thinking and the emotions. We're going to take some phone calls in a little bit on the show, so I want to give our number. It's 1-888-859-1800. One triple eight eight five nine eighteen hundred. Give us a call if you'd like to join in our conversation. The number is toll free anywhere in the U.S. So pick up the phone. 
We're also joined today by Jerome New, who is a philosopher at the University of California at Santa Cruz. He's the author of A Tear is an Intellectual Thing, The Meanings of Emotion, and he's joining us from Santa Cruz, California. Okay, Jerry New, what Jesse Prince has just said about conditioning and training opens up what, what to me is the most interesting part of, of, of this issue, which is what what's hanging in the balance here? Why does it matter what relationship exists between the physiology of emotions and the cognition of emotions? What's at stake? Well, I think it matters enormously. Uh, and let me just mention quickly three different ways it matters. One is in terms of the power of poetry. That is, if emotions were essentially bodily sensations, everyone in, in the world presumably would be open to exactly the same set of feelings. And if you didn't have certain feelings, it would be because of a gap in experience or a physiological problem like colorblindness. And for that sort of problem, the poet could provide no remedy. On the, on, on the other hand, if emotions are importantly constituted by thoughts and beliefs, by changing one's understanding, by giving not just new labels for a fixed set of feelings, but new ways of understanding, perceiving, and conceiving the world, the poet could give you new ways of experiencing the world. And this goes beyond the concession Jesse just made in terms of eliciting conditions. That is, the emotions that you can experience depend on the conceptual apparatus available to you. Uh, let me quote a line from Wittgenstein who said, we say a dog is afraid his master will beat him but not he is afraid his master will beat him tomorrow. Why not? That's not a rhetorical question. It's because dogs don't have concepts of time, because concepts of time depend on language, and dogs don't have the needed language. In order to have an emotional life extended in time, expectations for the distant future, regrets about the distant past, you need concepts of time. And so to be open to emotions of that sort, you need a certain conceptual apparatus. And if that's the situation, poets, as I've said, can give you new ways of understanding and so experiencing the world, as Wordsworth did for John Stuart Mill. So one thing is the power of poetry. Another is the possibility of talk therapies, of making your emotional life better by talking about it. If, as Spinoza claims, emotions are essentially constituted by thoughts, beliefs, or ideas, then discussing fantasies, memories, dreams, and the like may help improve your understanding, change your ideas, and change your emotional life. And finally, Poetry and therapy are just two parts of a much larger issue, that is, the room for human freedom. If Spinoza is right, because of the unique nature of reflexive knowledge, that is, self-knowledge, by understanding and thinking about your own psychological states, you may be able to change them and in that way become more free. That's quite a lot to think about. Uh, let me give our number for a moment while I think about it. one 859 one We invite you to join in our conversation about the emotions by giving us a call. The number is toll-free anywhere in the U.S., so we hope you will join in. You are listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. Jesse Prince, i got to admit, hearing Jerry New talk about the view of human freedom that, that might be related to his view of the emotions makes me want to be in his camp. <laughs> so tell me what you me see too. hanging in the back. <laughs> <laughs> tell me what you see. Were true. Tell me what you see <laughs> hanging in the balance here. Um, if I could just address a couple of the things, at least one point. Um, it's not a position that the Jamesian holds that thought can't cause emotions. Clearly it can. It would be foolish to deny that. Um, so the Jamesian claims that thought is amongst the things that can cause our emotions. A very committed Jamesian might even commit that thought is a kind of derivative cause of the emotions, that ultimately our goal is to get emotions in control of things that are less cognitive in nature so they can be more automatic, so they can be guides to life that don't require this added step of deliberation. We sometimes think too much. All thought, all reflection doesn't lead to action. Emotion has a motivating force that can drive us to act. By allowing emotions to play a role in decision making, we can act without this extra delay. If you think about the most so, so like stop me for one second. So, yeah. so what you're saying is that if you if you kind of like you're acknowledging and the Jamesian position even acknowledges that thoughts can trigger emotions. Um, the trick is to get the right thoughts to trigger the right emotions so that your compulsions to act or your urges to act are directed in the right way. Or or to drop out the thoughts completely. 
Okay. Wait, hold on. Well, hang on, hang on, because okay. Jesse Prince, you were going to say something else. I well, I, I just would want to illustrate with an emotion that Jerry mentioned before. So if you consider something like jealousy, which does seem to require a certain level of conceptual sophistication, we need to imagine, in the case of romantic jealousy, that our partner has been unfaithful to us. And notions of fidelity are, are complicated notions. But imagine this. Imagine that what happens is that on reflecting that uh, on somebody's infidelity, your lover's infidelity, you become angry at them, you become afraid that they're going to leave you, and you become disgusted at the thought that their body might be contaminated by another lover. So now you're in this state of disgust, fear, and anger, or a blend of those three emotions, each of which has a bodily component. That blend of bodily states that you're perceiving is your experience of jealousy. But now, having acquired such a blend, and having rehearsed this state or having had it on numerous occasions, you come to have this blend without going through the thoughts of infidelity. Now merely smelling the cologne of someone else on your lover's blouse can trigger this response. So you don't need to go through the reflection process every time you're jealous once you've learned to have that emotion. I'm just thinking if you're having that many experiences of jealousy, you might want to sit down with your partner <laughs> and have a maybe, conversation. Or, or, or maybe do some talk therapy. Yeah, not, not get to the but triggering even, point. But, it, but even once your body is taken off into this um, uh, complex of, of, of uh, physical states, uh, if you can transform your beliefs, persuade Othello that Iago planted the handkerchief and that in fact Desdemona has been faithful all along, your emotion will be transformed. Maybe now you'll be upset at yourself after all you've killed the woman. Um, it changes the state depending on what your beliefs are about the external world and about the physiological conditions. I want to emphasize that the Spinoza's claims and my claims are not causal claims. You were granting, Jesse, that thoughts could cause emotions, but I'm claiming, and Spinoza's claiming far more, thoughts can actually constitute emotions. And so changing the thoughts can, may necessarily change the emotions. So back to um, Gretchen's original example about the boss who's unfair. If the employee comes to believe that there was no other way the essential work could be done and that they were the best person to do it, they may cease to think that the boss was unfair and cease to be angry at the boss. Okay, we have to take a break in about a minute. And one thing that I really want to know, but I think we're going to have to talk about after the break, is if emotions are thoughts or if thoughts constitute emotions. What's the difference between emotions and other kinds of thoughts? They certainly seem really different. We'll have to find out, but we'll also have to take some phone calls at 1-888-859-1800. It's a toll-free number anywhere in the U.S. So give us a call if you have a question, if you have a comment. Join in our conversation about reason and emotions. I'm Gretchen Helfrich, and you are listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. I'm Gretchen Helfrich. Our conversation today is about the emotions and the relationship between thought and emotions. Our guests are philosopher Jesse Prins from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's joining us from Durham, North Carolina. And Jerome New, who is a philosopher at the University of California at Santa Cruz. And he joins us from Santa Cruz today. Our number one more time, 1-888-859-1800. Let's talk with Sam. Hello, Sam. You're on Odyssey. Hi. How are you? Fine, thanks. Um, uh, listening to this discussion, it sounds as though that these two concepts are mutually exclusive. However, I have a, I have a comment that uh, they're probably not mutually exclusive, and they're probably uh, two concepts that can be incorporated into one model. Uh, that would show how consciousness as well as subconsciousness would contribute to emotions forming and physical responses. So that was my comment and question. Okay, let me, let me put this to both of you, because neither of you wants to say that we are wholly in the realm of the mental or wholly in the realm of the physical in talking about the emotions. But maybe if we can get each of you to kind of state your, your bottom line of why you put yourself in one camp versus the other. Jerry New? 
Well, I think Sam is absolutely right that the two are not mutually exclusive. And I would add that I don't think the dispute, as I've said before, is about causal order. It's really about the differing roles of the bodily and the conceptual uh, in constituting emotions. And the claim I'm making in the Spinoza's tradition is that the essential role, that is the thing that makes your state of mind the particular distinctive state of mind it is, is the thought. That's what distinguishes regret from remorse and most emotions from other emotions. The difference between anger and rage may be a matter of degree of physiological upset, but most emotional distinctions depend ultimately on the thought. Jesse Prince? I also agree with Sam that the views are not mutually exclusive. A lot of theories think of emotions as multi-componential. They have various parts. One of those parts may be a perception of a bodily change. Another may be a thought. My reason for resisting that complex view is that I think about emotions as a term that refer to a real feature of the world. What we need to do as investigators is look at examples and see what they have in common. If you want to know what water is, you look at a lot of water samples and see what they all have in common, a certain microstructure. They're all H2O. If you look at a single example, a single water sample, it may have some other impurities in it. It may have some minerals from its source that you might mistake for the essence of water, but it's not the essence because it wouldn't be found in other samples. My view is that the common denominator unifying all emotions is the perception of bodily response. Some will be caused by judgments, some will have accompanying judgments, but when the judgments aren't there, emotions can remain. When your boss has insulted you and now you come to recognize her reasons and forgive her, you might feel this residual anger. You no longer have the thought, the anger remains. What's common across all instances of emotion is that feeling of bodily response. All right, let's uh, take another call. Let's talk with Diana. Hello, Diana, you're on Odyssey. Hello. I have a question about bodily response. Um, sometimes you have a bodily response that you would think would be emotion, but it is not, as in crying. After both my children were born, I cried at the drop of a hat. Little children may cry when they're just plain tired. How do you factor this into what is an emotion if it's a physical response that isn't really got an emotion behind it? Jesse Prince? Well, in the case of sadness, I wouldn't say any single isolated bodily response, like merely crying, is enough to give us the full-blown feeling. Usually there's a pattern, a global change in your autonomic nervous system, in your muscles and your skeleton that are affecting your experience. When some of those are absent, your ability to identify the state as, as sadness may be diminished. That said, I think emotions can be uh, erroneous. They can occur in inappropriate contexts. It's like visual illusions. If you see two lines that are the same length with angles at the end in opposite directions, they'll look like they're differ differing in length. Likewise, things can cause emotional responses in us even when the emotion is inappropriate. If you have a change in your hormones, you can end up having an emotional response. It really is bona fide sadness. It really counts as an instance of upset. But you're not recognizing any appropriate eliciting condition, so you don't identify it as an emotion, or you say to yourself, I don't understand why I'm sad, nothing has gone wrong. But so are you having the emotion? Uh, the, the, in the case that is described, it would depend a little bit on how much of the physiology is in place. If the system is fully engaged, that is, if you're in the state of the kind that you would be, be in in ordinary instances of sadness, then you are having the emotion. If it's a single local aspect of that change, it wouldn't count as sadness at all. As Jerry points out in his book, tears themselves can occur for a wide range of emotions. We have tears mm -hmm. of sorrow and tears of joy. Jerry New? Yes, well, um, I was going to add two complications. One is the one that Jesse just mentioned. That is, a certain fixed physiology, the mechanisms of crying, may express both sadness and joy, tears of happiness, tears, tears of sadness. The physiology isn't what differentiates them. And I think referring to the eliciting conditions brings you closer to thinking about the mental element. But if you go a step further and recognize, as I would, unconscious thoughts, someone may burst into tears while they're in the middle of gardening, not worrying about anything in particular. But they might uncover unconscious thoughts that ultimately do make those tears of sadness. All right, let's uh, take another call. Let's talk with Lisa. Hello, Lisa, you're on Odyssey. Good morning. Uh, this is a fascinating conversation, and I actually had one question regarding societal impact on all of this, um, very much agreeing with what Jerry is saying. But if you look at it, we're not taught 
as a society that emotions are something that we can control. What you're taught is that you have a choice in terms of what to do with it. And I think what some of the research is bearing out and what I find so interesting is the element of consciousness that if you make people aware at a much younger age that consciousness and and additionally the subconsciousness is what can trigger and making a thought into an emotion that if that's a skill that we're taught then it allows us to then therefore have that freedom that Jerry was discussing and have a much better connection to how our own thought patterns trigger the emotional states that we find ourselves in. We're we're taught as a society your emotions are your emotions. It's the choices you make after you have them and I think that's erroneous. I think it's you make choices about how you feel. One, one possible way to look at that is if you have two people on an airplane and one is a, is, a, is a person who has a trigger to fear of flying and the other person doesn't, and they hit the same choppy air, one person is going to feel much more anxious and have a much deeper emotional response than the other person who says, that's just choppy air. Um, now, Jerry New, I assume that you would agree largely with what Lisa says. Well, largely, I, I would just want to elaborate it and, and use the expression, the Spinoza's expression I used earlier, the power of reflexive knowledge, that is self-knowledge. That is, knowledge about your own bodily states typically has no effect on that state. It doesn't matter what you think your height is. It doesn't make you an inch taller if you think you're you know, 6'1 instead of what the tape measure says, 6. However, your beliefs about your psychological states and about what causes them does have an effect on those states because those states include those beliefs. The objects of your emotion are typically what you believe caused them. And if you change your beliefs about that, you change the specific nature of that emotion. But Jesse Prince, well, I was just going to say, Jesse Prince, your view of the emotions doesn't preclude the possibility that you can um, control them or, or alter them in some way. In other words, have different reactions. No, to the contrary. I think thoughts are very reliable causes of the emotions. Changing your thoughts can change your emotional experience. My claim is simply that thought isn't essential. It's not the only cause of our emotions. Seeing a person with a very graphic injury can lead to disgust. Seeing somebody glare at you can lead to anger. Seeing a bug crawling across your kitchen kitchen can lead to fear. Perception can trigger emotion. So can changes in our physiology brought on by, say, hormonal change. There are many causes of the emotions and many ways to control them. That, that's right. I just want to add that perceiving can be understood as a kind of thinking. Okay. So so you, there's a lot of convergence here in, in terms of how much control we have over our emotions, but ultimately you two are, are not coming down in the same place on this question, I think. Right? Well, I think the, the <laughs> one, one of the sharpest differences between us is between the, the notion that thoughts can be causes of emotions, which Jesse has conceded, and the notion that thoughts constitute emotions, which I'm not sure he has conceded. No, I mean, I would, I, I would say, I mean, <laughs> with regard to the conceptual point, the real question is, would somebody count as being in an emotional state if they didn't have the appropriate thought, the thought that Jerry takes to be constitutive of the emotion? My, my view is that they would be, that somebody who, say, was provoked by uh, her boss and had come now to forgive her boss, but still had the residual physiological response, would say of herself, you know, I still feel angry, even though I know it's unjustified, even though I know my boss did nothing wrong. Jerry would be forced to say that she's still subconsciously thinking that her boss wronged her. That strikes me as an open empirical possibility, but it seems implausible on the face of it. I have another alternative to quickly resorting to the unconscious. That is, the residual anger, as you call it, is not the same anger. Before, you might have been angry at the boss. Now you're angry at your job situation, or you're upset at yourself at having jumped to such quick conclusions. But the the state of mind is no longer the same. All right. I, I, I know you want to respond, angry. but we need to take more calls. So <laughs> <laughs> let's take a call from Steve. Hello, Steve. You're on Odyssey. Hello. I don't know if this is a contribution or not, but I'm an actor. <laughs> And I have made, it's part and parcel of the actor's game to generate emotions, real emotions, by, with real physiological responses. Always underneath it, however, is an element of control. I have no control in my real life. I, my emotions take over quite easily. But on stage, I can be trembling with fury and still be aware of my cues and how to, not to stab somebody, really. <laughs> interesting, very interesting. Um, Jesse Prince, what's your reaction to that? 
Uh, that, that is fascinating. I'd be extremely interested uh, to know from Steve how those emotions are induced. That is, do you reflect on something that's angered you in the past, or have you mastered it to the point where you can directly control your body? And I, if so, when you do that, does it feel like the emotion? Well, are you, am I still on? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I uh, used to use a effective memory from a, a, an original emotional state. Nowadays, it's been you know 150 plays. Uh, my character's emotions are enough. I have an exterior personality that I wear over mine, but it's more or less in charge of me. It's, it's, it's important, however, to recognize that that's just one theory of acting associated famously with the name Stanislavski. That is, in order to portray an emotional state, you actually have to somehow work yourself up into that state. But Diderot, uh, the French philosopher, several centuries before Stanislavski, wrote a book called The Paradox of Acting, arguing that in fact in order to portray an emotion well, it's better not to be in that state. Just as to portray saying being a drunk on stage, it's better if you're not actually drunk. And he gave a whole series of arguments. So for example, the scenes may change quickly. So five minutes after deep grief, you may have to be in a joyous scene and the emotions can't be manipulated that quickly. Or even if they could, you'd be worn out by the end of a week of such performances. In order to put on the outward face of an emotion, you do need to put on the outward face, but that doesn't necessarily entail that the inner state will follow, despite whatever William James might think. Okay, we just have a little bit of time left, but I want to know this. Um, let's, let's get practical for a moment. Jerry New, what is it that we might be able to do um, on your account of the emotions that we couldn't do on Jesse Prince's? Well, as I said, it, it looks like there's greater room for freedom, greater control over our emotional lives if thoughts play an essential role in those lives. I don't want to be understood to be claiming that we could simply choose our emotions because I also don't think we can choose our thoughts or our beliefs. Uh, there are limits here. But by improving our understanding and worrying, for example, when we're angry at our boss, whether we're having an appropriate understanding of the situation, we may transform that anger into something else. And and one of the things that we can do is to think carefully about what we take to be the causes of our psychological state. Jerome New is a philosopher at the University of California at Santa Cruz. He is the author of A Tear is an Intellectual Thing, The Meanings of Emotion. He joined us today from Santa Cruz. Jesse Prince, what can we do on your account that we can't do on Jerry News? Take the example of racial prejudice. A lot of people who are white are exposed to images of people of color only through the news media and only in negative context. The result is that whenever we see someone of color on television, we have an immediate visceral response, an immediate response that can be measured in terms of our physiology, our felt emotion, and the judgments that we make. If emotions are triggered by perceptions without thought, what we need to do to change these emotional responses is to retrain our way of perceiving the world. The cognitive view of emotions would have it that simply changing our thought pattern is enough. Often it's not enough. We need to retrain our perceptions and making an emotional difference, making a change in our emotional response is hard work. Jesse Prince is a philosopher at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. He is the author of a forthcoming book on emotional perception and he joined us from Durham, North Carolina. Jesse Prince and Jerome New, thank you both very much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks also to everyone for listening and for calling. Odyssey's theme music was composed and performed by OK Go. Thanks to our research assistant, James Lyris. Today's show was engineered by Ernst Carroll. We'd like to thank Ernst for all his hard work this past week, and we look forward to working with him again in the future. Thank you. Our technical producer is Steve Warnowskis. Our program is produced by Allison Cuddy and Delia Lloyd. The senior producer of Odyssey is Joshua Andrews. Odyssey is a production of Chicago Public Radio under General Manager Tori Malatia. I'm Gretchen Helfrich. Join us again next time for Odyssey. <laughs>